Good enough. I'm Mitch. I'm Andy. Andy. Um. We're located in Southeast North Dakota, right by uh, Lisbon, along the Shire River. Uh, farm was established in 1946. Grandpa and Grandma established it. Um, people involved, there's me and Andy's families, mom and dad. Uh, Cropland is 4,500 acres. Um, one pivot irrigated. Dad's got 400 head of cows, cow calf pairs. Uh, we farm anything from uh, gravel to uh, we have some valley uh, land too. So we got pretty much any kind of soil that there is out there. This is the average rainfall kind of in our area. Um, you guys can look at uh, 2010, uh, 8, 9, and 10, even in 2007. Kind of keep them in the back of your mind for later on in this presentation. Uh, used to graze uh, mostly wheat corn, uh, a little bit of soybeans, uh, some flowers and alfalfa. Uh, we did all of our uh, chisel plowing, plowing in fall, perfect light in the spring, seeded it. Uh, reason we went, decided to go with the change. We need to update some machinery, basically planter and drill, um, adding more acres less help or the same amount of help, cut the input costs, and dad said, I want to give it a try. They tried it back in the 60s, I guess, and didn't have very good uh, results. And second attempt was in the 80s with uncle, and same deal, no. Basically doing chemical. Yeah. They had a drill, or able to get it in the ground, but it sounded, but chemical was a big thing. We brought some stuff like that. When we started, um, fall of 2001, completely switched um, from conventional to no-till. That fall, we didn't work a thing. Jumped right into it, got a different drill, planter. Um. Since then, we've changed our crop rotation a little bit. Uh, still the corn, the wheat, uh, soybeans. Uh, winter wheat, probably a little more of now. Tried some kind of off, raised some radishes, and we just keep trying to expand our, our crop rotation and different stuff to keep it mixed up. Obstacles were encountered residue management, seeding for the first three years, weed control, um, dealing with excess moisture, uh, meshing innovation with the farm program and crop insurance. Um, when we started, the residue management. We didn't have a transfer and combine feed. Didn't pay real good attention to, you know, we didn't get to worry about it. <laughs> when you're plowing and chisel plowing, that didn't matter. Seeding for the first three years, the ground is, is different. It's, we had trouble getting trench closed up. Um, Soil becomes like firmer, or solider, but it's, it's sticky, it's, doesn't flow at all, and you can usually get the seed in the ground, but like I said, you, we could never get it covered up decent, or it was hard to do that. Um, best thing was, since we've started this no-till stuff, we were in the wetter years, basically we couldn't screw up in the spring for the most part. We had rain in our favor to get going on. Um, our residue, like he was saying, one of the things I noticed one of the first years, no chaff spreader on the combines, uh, we got late snow in the spring and on soybean ground when it started to warm up the uh, uh, chaff winter rolls were still snow on the middle of the afternoon and before noon the snow was gone right away so we could see a temperature thing right off the bat on our residue thing. We control uh, when you first change from one system to the next you get weeds you never be had. It's uh something different and them you just learn as you go along to deal with them. As long as you deal with them right off the bat, it, it'll all work out the end. Uh, 
residue, residue management, a lot of the trouble was wheat. We were running straight heads. Um, and then we did go to chaff spreaders, but still, we did buy a heavy pair of, of course, that was the answer. <laughs> we got rid of it. <laughs> and we went to stripper heads, and that on um, wheat cured our problems. Um, we were running two combines with straight heads. We went to one on the wheat, but later on, more acres, we ended up with two stripper heads. This is what we've seen in the wetter years. Um, one thing that Dad always said, yeah, Mother Nature will always take care of it itself and leave it to us to mess it up. Uh, this picture, uh, he started on the first pass around the field. This is the second pass on the field. I did not fall asleep. Dotto steering. <laughs> first pass is over here on the down side of the screen here. He went through there, not a problem. Second pass, this is what happened. This was a low ground that we had, it hadn't been cropped. Looked dry enough. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no water in it. Um, as we talk here, if it's been cropped, and we'll probably get into that, you got, what do you want to call it? Work structure in the ground. Yeah. There you go. The other thing is with tillage, uh, when you till, ground if it's wet, you fall out of sight because you'll fall into what's been tilled before you get to the water. Uh, what we're seeing in a no-till thing, you just won't walk on water. It's up to you come like this. <laughs> um, soybean harvest fall away. Uh, it got, we got excessive moisture. Here, we're combining soybeans in the, the same, really a low ground. It's just a flat field. Um, after seven, eight years of no-till, we found out what we cropped, we can take off for the most part. We drill. This is water too. We drove through here and there is virtually no ruts. We never, after that, that fall, we didn't do nothing to it. We farmed it since. It ain't rough. Um, biggest thing is keep the combine empty. John Deere's Hydroflex has worked better for years. So. The other thing we called too on the rut thing, like you said, we didn't hardly really leave any tracks at all. Combine or keep your tracks going the same direction for the most part. That way, if it does become somewhat rough, you have crossing tracks. One thing we've learned, especially from the sprayer, is usually that sprayer we have more trouble than anything else. Um, I think right in front of the combine there, I think that is sprayer tracks that you can see from the summer. And, you know, yeah, yeah. and this was an excessively wet fall all through bean harvest. We combined through water or on water. But I think that fall we harvested all but maybe one or two acres of the total acres that we planted. Improving the soil structure, same deal. Um, I don't know if that's the same year. Yep, yeah, same year. Just showing too the standing water. It's not a not a slough that's there every year. It was there that fall. Took our time working around it, as you can see by the tracks, the ruts there. These we might have lightly uh, touched them up with a field cultivator just to take the sharpness out of them, but no more than that. Is that baby looking? This was seeding um, spring of, I don't even know, eight or nine, ten. 
And this is what we, same, or the field we cropped and uh, seeding through the water. Seeded, even in the wet years, the more years of seeding you had, you had root structure in the ground. Uh, when the wet years come, the root structure will carry you up. Uh, if you have a wet spot that had a lot of wash standing water in it, and there's a, basically no living plants ever growing there, uh, don't drag through that because <laughs> that goes back to the photo drag picture of the bottom falls out. Since we've uh, added CR CRP to the cropping system, um, this is the slack test that they took when they did a uh, crop tour a few years ago at our place. Um, at least one of our fields was in on it. Ours is the first one with eight years of no-till. Uh, the CRP is the center one, and it's showing how the aggregates hold up in the water. And then the uh, conventional one was right across the road from ours, and they've been tilling for years, still are. And this is what we found on uh, rough CRP. We'll take them just a light disc, just touch the ground, take the high spots off, hit it once or twice. Field cultivator, same deal, just so it touches the ground, just knock the high spots off. and. Trying to get it smoothed out as best we can without disturbing the profile. The CRP, you've got how many years of, of growth in there. You're on a no-till system, you're that many years ahead. So don't want to disturb it. It's a good start to start off. The biggest thing is you got to get it smooth enough so you can be able to stay on the farm. Most generally, we use corn. Um, we've tried soybeans. <coughs> Yield at all. Um, Weed control is a big yeah. thing with corn CRP. Uh, at least in our country, Canada thistle is a big issue with the corn. You've got broadleaf control. Uh, you got uh, Roundup corn. You got grass control. Beans broadleaf control is limited. Um, like he said, our no. tried beans once or twice, and we can't get them yield corn. Uh, but the next slide to see that. Yields we've obtained from corn yield has been very close to what, uh, depending on the rainfall, but we've had yields that run close to stuff that we've had in for, been in the hotel system as long as we have been. What did you put in this year? Stuff that we've rented has been in CRP for years. And, uh, come on to CRP and we were able to so. Then after a while we uh, the wet years and the found out adding cover crops would be we heard anyway that would be helpful. Winter or um, wheat ground was especially we're coming more saturated, take the wheat off, nothing growing. Um, so we added cover crops in 08 and trying to improve the spring seeding too, springtime. There's nothing growing in there. Um, use up ex excess moisture. The cover crop things, we learned a lot from the early county um, workshop out there, which is how we got started into them, and with the moisture and stuff, I think we fell into that. We started with the cover crops, seeing we were able to carry up better in the spring because the cover crops would take off starting to use up some of that excess moisture that you wanted to get rid of and you can terminate them depending on how extra spring is when you want to. And the traffic ability on the living um, plants is a lot better than having just nothing out there. I mean, it's, um, yeah, the reason for it improved, improved traffic ability and Improve the infiltration, use some excess moisture, try to increase the organic matter, 
the no drain dial. And like I said, the thing we seen was in the spring of the year, you got a wet spring. Um, you got the living living plants between you and the soil, no mud up to speak of. Uh, you can go through wet spots if you had a good cover crop there. Um, if they didn't grow, it was still then you didn't have to turn for them, waste time and make more ruts and tracks. Um, one more benefit was the year. Right away in the spring, the winter wheat and stuff would be coming before you could even get into the field. And you'd get to harvest more sunlight in that part of it. Uh, in the way we were going, it was probably getting us in the field earlier than something that we didn't have cover crops on. Some other reasons why we were shooting for cover crops is to try and reduce our fertilizer costs. Adversity to the soil. This with cover crops, we could put in more uh, like the radishes to, to open up the soil, uh, the legumes for nitrogen, um, the grass families for the fibrous roots to get more roots in the ground. Um, and it just seemed like when we started with it, it was really uh, all positive the way that we see it so far. Different ways we've tried to um, get cover crops into standing corn. We've done it in soybean stew. We always wanted to try cover crop and standing corn, so we uh, had this little spreader laying around, mounted on our sprayer, and uh, gave that a shot. The thing we tried there worked somewhat. The biggest thing is with broadcasting is we found that if you don't have rain at the right time, uh, you can put all the stuff that you want and it may or may not work. Um, cover crops in general, drilling we found is the best way to put them in the ground. You just about always get a catch with drilling. Uh, we've done a lot of different broadcasting things, trying on it, our success rate isn't real good on that. but. We're not giving up on it yet either. We're still experimenting with the broadcasting. There's the timing, I think, is a lot of it. Um, when to do it, how much, that stuff we haven't figured out yet, but we're still playing with all the options on that. And, no, that's not a but but well, this is, we, this was on. That's corn. That's corn. corn. They corn and soybeans one fall. Get about 400 acres and have a plane broadcast on it. Um, that spreader you've seen before, we rented that, which is tough to get in our area. Nobody has one. The biggest thing is the other, other thing is, is to get it when you want it. Uh, your window of opportunity is pretty small on when to do it. We we're able to talk the plane into doing it. There's no tracks, you know, no crop loss or damage. And when we say we tried it, that fall it forgot to rain, so we wouldn't gain nothing by this one either. Big bill. <laughs> so, we scrounged up some junk and made a inner seeder. We, uh, this is the toolbar of a field cultivator that we don't need to cultivate corn anymore. Took some old, uh, John Deere planter units and stuck on the back of it, and then a Belmar for uh, small seed. Uh, we tried running some soybeans and peas, field peas, through the boxes and then used the Belmar for the small seed, radish, or no, that type of stuff. Um, the Belmar works really good. The planter units are outdated, that doesn't work so good. So. Tried it a couple different years, so two years ago, same deal, we had a fair success rate, I think it forgot to rain again, either that or we didn't get it quite deep enough. Uh, last summer we tried it, we had a really good success rate there, we didn't do that many acres, but it was seeded with the planter, with openers, the seed was in the ground, we just needed a little rain and we actually caught a little bit this last summer to make this work. 
And as Lee was saying, you got to try out your new tractor. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not really prejudiced. We got green and red and orange. And that is the result from the spinner spreader on the, I think on the front of our sprayer. Cover crop in there. Radish should turn up. Uh, winter wheat. That field, we actually chopped the corn, so after the corn was chopped, we still got something growing in there, not black ground. Um, also turned cows up on that particular chunk, so they had a little bit to graze on. After we took it off for silage and sunlight, we got to get the sunlight, that stuff exploded on some of it. It doesn't do nothing all summer long, and when it gets sun, it just took off. This is our other cover crop idea we came up with. Um, we run a cart behind our corn planter for fertilizer and stuff. Uh, the rows are paired up there. The fertilizer opener is one, and the seed opener is the other. We run radishes down the uh, planter, so they're on 30 inch rows. Uh, you know, just radishes on the planter. And in the cart, we were able to throw in peas. Winter wheat or rye in there. And we seeded them as our um, bio strip filler. There you go. And all these famous words. C2 with the uh, wetlands there, which is cattails and whatever. That fall we were able to seed through the uh, cattails. We sprayed everything off to kill everything. This was pea ground, I believe. And, uh, did nothing with the cattails. Some of the cattails were as tall as a tractor cat when I went through them. And the next picture on the show, right there, this is through the cattails. We were able to get seed to come up through that. Our intentions there was to go with, uh, put corn on that the next year, open the radishes and pull up some uh, nutrients from below. And which we did put corn on there this year, but our Corn we didn't put on that field, had to get hailed out, so we couldn't really set a fair test trial of what it had potential of due to the hail. Um, this is one, uh, one thing we tried this fall with uh, wetlands, low ground. Um, seed and winter wheat with a floater, uh, fertilizer spreader. And I guess our idea of it is here. These wetlands we haven't been able to get into for years. Uh, winter wheat, we've had very good luck with winter wheat and rye. They always seem to come up in the spring. Uh, so we're hoping to try and get some of these wetlands back by doing this. You get something growing in there, start using up more moisture you can right off the bat. So hopefully when we get in there in the spring of the year to do some planting that they will have the moisture under control for the most part. Right in front of it there, the grass part, that's been deep enough water where even cattails won't even grow. Now this fall it's, it was dry enough to get through there. Um, we will probably mow these with rotary mowers, all we'll do. And one or two reasons, uh, snow catch is a big thing with the cattails. Mow them down so you hopefully catch less snow so you know, it doesn't fill up in the spring. And then Hopefully, maybe that by mowing it, the uh, mower will cover up the seed even better yet to get a better seed to soil contact for next spring. Um, yeah, there's that interseeder again. Um, this is the results of it. Yeah, that's the results of the, on the, what we planted, except for the couple of solid thistles in there we plant them. But, um, it was on pea ground. This field we did do a cover crop, just like the uh, Isle Strip Hill. Um, and this is the one that Abby did tests on. And, and uh, Lee was out there and looked at it. And it ran really good this year.
it would have been dead on until I got to the soybean ground on the north side. I'll show you. Uh, we're, with the cover crops, and we got livestock, or dad does, um, we're trying to get the livestock integrated a little bit better with it. Um, and we haven't real good yet. Nobody wants a fence, I don't think. So. <laughs> This chunk here, one thing we like to bring up here, uh, when the tractor sets up there in the corner, uh, where our silage pile is right off the left of that. Well, every fall we bring in all our hay, it sets on this plus five, six acres here. Uh, we bring all the hay in in the fall, feed the hay off there all winter long. Come spring, we run it all up. We used to run it all up. You said since we've done no-till with it, back when we we used to run it all up. We go out in the spring of the year with a disc, chisel ball. We spend two or three days on five acres trying to knock the ruts down, trying to get it level enough to seed. And when we were all said and done, it was baseballs, golf balls, bowling balls, and you couldn't get nothing to grow in it. Since we've been to the no tail system with this, the first couple of years might have been not as good. It probably looks like pavement when you pull in there in the spring, but we are able to seed into it. Um, our ruts are practically none anymore. What ruts we do have, and we're running off the drag a little bit and level off the sharp ones and, and break up all the loose hay that's been left from, from the haystack set in there. And we've got corn, which is on the uh, right side of the row of trees there. And if you did not know the difference, you couldn't tell that this side was so it's there's the no till has got the potentials that you have to have things like this that you see them and that we've seen so far. This is the field, the inner cedar pictures in the um, fall harvest year, this year, two weeks ago maybe. Al was out, took some pictures. And this is the mainly just radishes coming here, still growing after a uh, pretty hard frost. Um, and all the residue, which a lot of people say, what are we going to do with that? I don't know. I suppose we're going to leave it. <laughs> but uh, no, this has got good opportunity. We ain't going to this year, but if you're to turn cows out there for grazing, um, Since then, the RCS in town has come a long way and helped us 
last few years quite a bit. So that's in these conventions like we're here today. Uh, it's a big eye opener for everybody to see what there is potential of. And the steep, continuous, never ending learning curves. I mean, never stop learning. And uh, even what we listen to today, I mean, it, uh, it's a little nervous. <laughs> The 2013 straw management, like the one above it, you never stop learning. Uh, goes back to residue management. This year we were going to get rich on baling straw and saving straw for that. Um, so we put the straight heads back on. Combine all our wheat this year, baled up 90% of it for straw. Should have went and bought it. Exactly. One field that was on some gravelly ground, lighter ground. I mean, it was knee high at the very highest of straw. We took that off of the heads, and then he went in there and seeded winter wheat into it, and then goes back to the beginning of when we started no tilling it. Uh, we had a layer of wet straw. Of course, fall, less sunlight, little rain. Uh, went around it once, got out, walked away for a few days. It, uh, no, you got a lot of hair pinning, too much stuff to cut through. Um, the guy had more heat, more sunlight, it'd be better, but fall year, you never know. But, yeah, it was put a check mark by it and don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> this, I don't know, we're finally getting a little more modern, but um, over the years, we got yield monitors in the combines, but no mapping. And a yield ma a monitor is only as good as the guy running it or want it to be. And it's how high the number you want it to be. So, um, no, over the years after we no till and sitting there staring at that thing all day over the hilltops and through the low ground, I tell him that our fluctuation looks like it's getting less. And of course, we never had no mapping and never really gave a crap, but we got mapping in the combine now, or the one we use on corn, that's the only one. And this field here is the one with the interseeder and stuff, that was pea ground last year. And it's pretty consistent. As Look at this one, a lot of variation, and that's the first year out of CRP. Um, these two chunks of ground are a half mile, that blue is a half mile between them. Uh, it's as fair a comparison as we can give you. Um, like anything, there can be a lot of different variables, but they're as fair as fair can be for the most part. Um, like I said, the consistency, and we're seeing that. Uh, we've got some gravelly ground too, and that's probably where it's the most noticeable. There'd be heavy low spots in it and the gravelly knobs. And you can see it on Lee and Andrew were out this summer. The gravel top knobs were still green two, three weeks after no rain on soybeans. Hard to believe that it could hold on for that long because in years past you could always see the they are sand streaks or gravel streaks just right down the road. Uh, you didn't even have to, you just knew what it was. So this year we tried to watch, like I said, on the mapping and just wanted to open everybody's eyes to it that uh, what we're seeing in the no-till is that the uh, yields get more consistent in the field. Um, get rid of the lows and the highs might come down a little bit, but you get a more consistent yield. And then two on this quarter, it was all peas except for the, see that kind of a definite line there from there north. And there's a draw that runs through here, and, a, and that's kind of a hillside, but it's well, I guess the next picture shows something more, but that was soybean ground. And from there to there, there ain't no difference hardly in soil, and there was not yield. And that's just the, the soil's map. Um, that's the 80.
some of the future challenges. Um, a lot of farmers, we were probably that way included. You had a crop rotation. I mean, you didn't even have to think about it. Everything was in a set order. You ask us now where our crop rotation is. So whatever next spring brings, we try and put the crop that best suits the field in the spring due to moisture condition, conditions, due to weed control. Um, if we had too much grass crop in there, and then we try and go to a legume or a bean or something to change the roots in the ground. Um, basically, we, we have more set, set rotation. Um, benefits of cover crops, I think that's just the beginning of what, what cover crops can do. Uh, I think that's a big, wide open space yet that we all have a lot to learn on yet. Weed control. That goes back to cover crops somewhat too. Um, if you can get the cover crops in in the right place, basically you're planting the weed that you want to control. Because if you have something growing there, usually the weeds don't compete. The weeds like it where it's wide open, free for them to grow on. So we're trying to use the cover crops in place of, of chemicals so that we control the weeds. And the other thing is with that, the livestock, we like to have it more integrated so you can make the CRP and livestock or the CRP. No till system and the, the cattle work together more. But we haven't done that yet. That's the end.
start on it in the fall by leveling this. Better yet, if you can only get it burned off and get no tillage done to it um, in the fall. Uh, you can get a spray in the fall, but spray it the first thing after it comes back green, and that gives you your first time of killing it. The grass is tough, it'll, it'll keep coming back, keep coming back. And, um, I don't think we have any on this time, but when you get it smoothed out, so it's smooth, we've seeded corn into it, and it'll be as green as your lawn, and let the corn go for a couple, three days or whatever to try and give the corn a chance to get started and spray it, provided you got moisture too. If you got a really dry spring, earlier the better. Just conserve all the moisture you can. And we basically just level the top off easiest and the lightest way that you can. We've got excellent luck with it. Thank you. Anyway, looking at the time, if you can hold your additional questions, I'm mentioning you're going to be back for <coughs>